Section 5 of Whirly Gigs by O. Henry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Matter of Mean Elevation. One winter, the Alcazar Opera Company of New Orleans made a speculative trip along the Mexican, Central American, and South American coasts. The venture proved the most successful one. The music-loving, impressionable Spanish Americans deluged the company with dollars and vivas. The manager waxed plump and amiable. But for the prohibitive climate, he would have put forth the distinctive flower of his prosperity, the overcoat of fur, braided, frogged, and opulent. Almost was he persuaded to raise the salaries of his company. But with a mighty effort, he conquered the impulse towards such an unprofitable effervescence of joy. At Makuto, on the coast of Venezuela, the company scored its greatest success. Imagine Coney Island translated into Spanish, and you will comprehend Makuto. The fashionable season is from November to March. Down from La Graya and Caracas and Valencia and other interior towns flock the people for their holiday season. They are bathing in fiestas and bullfights and scandal. And then the people have a passion for music that the bands in the plaza and on the sea beach stir but do not satisfy. The coming of the Alcazar Opera Company aroused the utmost ardor and zeal among the pleasure-seekers. The illustrious Guzman Blanco, president and dictator of Venezuela, sojourned in Macuto with his court for the season. That potent ruler, who himself paid a subsidy of 40,000 pesos each year to Grand Opera in Caracas, ordered one of the government warehouses to be cleared for a temporary theater. The stage was quickly constructed and rough wooden benches made for the audience. Private boxes were added for the use of the president and the notables of the army and government. The company remained in Makuto for two weeks. Each performance filled the house as closely as it could be packed. Then the music-mad people fought for room in the open doors and windows and crowded about hundreds deep on the outside. Those audiences formed the brilliantly diversified patch of color. The hue of their faces ranged from clear olive of the pure-blood Spaniards down through the yellow and brown shades of the mestizos to the coal-black Carib and Jamaican Negro. Scattered among them were little groups of Indians with faces like stone idols, wrapped in gaudy fiber woven blankets, Indians down from the mountain states of Zamora and Los Andes and Miranda, to trade their gold dust in the coast towns. The spell cast upon these denizens of the interior fastness was remarkable. They sat in petrified ecstasy, conspicuous among the excitable Macutans, who wildly strove with tongue and hand to give evidence of their delight. Only once did the somber rapture of these aboriginals find expression. During the rendition of Faust, Guzman Blanco extravagantly pleased by the jewel song, cast upon the stage a purse of gold pieces. Other distinguished citizens followed his lead to the extent of whatever loose coin they had convenient, while some of the fair and fashionable senoras were moved in imitation to fling a jewel or a ring or two at the feet of the Marguerite, who was, according to the bills, Mademoiselle Nina Gerard. Then from different parts of the house rose sundry of the stolid hillmen and cast upon the stage little brown and dun bags that fell with soft thumps and did not rebound. It was, no doubt, pleasure at the tribute to her art that caused Mademoiselle's Gerard's eyes to shine so brightly when she opened these little deerskin bags in her dressing room and found them to contain pure gold dust. If so, the pleasure was rightly hers for her voice and song, pure, strong, and thrilling, with the feeling of the emotional artist, deserved the tribute that it earned. But the triumph of the Alcazar Opera Company is not the theme. It but leans upon and colors it. There happened in Makuto a tragic thing, an unsolvable mystery that sobered for a time the gaiety of the happy season. One evening, between the short twilight and the time when she should have whirled upon the stage, in red and black of the ardent Carmen, Mademoiselle Nina Gerard disappeared from sight and ken 
of six thousand pairs of eyes and as many minds in Makuto. There was the usual turmoil of hurrying to seek her. Messengers flew to the little French-kept hotel where she stayed. Others of the company hastened here and there where she might be lingering in some tienda or unduly prolonging her bath upon the beach. All search was fruitless. Mademoiselle had vanished. Half an hour passed and she did not appear. The dictator, unused to the caprices of prima donna, became impatient. He sent an aide from his box to say to the manager that if the curtain did not at once rise, he would immediately hail the entire company to the calabusa, though it would desolate his heart indeed to be compelled to such an act. Birds in Makuto could be made to sing. The manager abandoned hope for the time of Mademoiselle Girard, a member of the chorus who had dreamed hopelessly for years of the blessed opportunity, quickly carmenized herself and the opera went on. Afterward, when the lost Cantu Triche appeared not, the aid of the authorities was invoked. The president at once set the army, the police, and all citizens to the search. Not one clue to Mademoiselle Girard's disappearance was found. The Alcazar left to fill engagements farther down the coast. On the way back, the steamer stopped at Makuto, and the manager made anxious inquiry. Not a trace of the lady had been discovered. The Alcazar could do no more. The personal belongings of the missing lady were stored in the hotel against her possible later reappearance, and the opera company continued upon its homeward voyage to New Orleans. On the Camino Real along the beach, the two saddle mules and four pack mules of Don Senor Johnny Armstrong stood, patiently awaiting the crack of the whip of the Arrio Luis. That would be the signal for the start on another long journey into the mountains. The pack mules were loaded with varied assortments of hardware and cutlery. These articles Don Johnny traded to the interior Indians for the gold dust that they washed from the Andean streams and stored in quills and bags against his coming. It was a profitable business, and Senor Armstrong expected soon to be able to purchase the coffee plantation that he coveted. Armstrong stood on the narrow sidewalk, exchanging garbled Spanish with old Peralto, the rich native merchant, who had just charged him four prices for half a gross of pot-metal hatchets and abridged English with Rucker, the little German who was counsel for the United States. "'Take with you, senor,' said Peralto, "'the blessing of the saints upon your journey.' "'Better try quinine,' growled Rucker through his pipe. "'Take two grains every night. "'And don't make your trip too long, Johnny, "'because we have needs of you. "'It is ein villainous game, de Melville play, of wits, "'and there is no other substitute. "'Auf Wiedersehen, and keep your eyes on the mule's ears between you and the edge of the precipice ride. The bells of Louise's mules jingled, and the pack train filed after the warning note. Armstrong waved a goodbye and took his place at the tail of the procession. Up the narrow street they turned and passed the two-story wooden hotel Inglis, where Ives and Dawson and Richards and the rest of the chaps were dwaddling on the broad piazza, reading week-old newspapers. They crowded to the railing and shouted many friendly and wise and foolish farewells after him. Across the plaza, they trotted slowly past the bronze statue of Guzman Blanco with its fence of bayoneted rifles captured from revolutionists, and out of the town between the rows of thatched huts swarming with the unclothed youth of Makato. They plunged into the damp coolness of banana groves at length to emerge upon a bright stream where brown women in scant raiment laundered clothes destructively upon the rocks. Then the pack train, fording the stream, attacked the sudden ascent and bade adieu to such civilization as the coast afforded. For weeks Armstrong, guided by Louise, followed his regular route among the mountains. After he had collected an aroba, of the precious metal, winning a profit of nearly $5,000, the heads of the lightened mules were turned down trail again. Where the head of the Garico River springs from a great gash in the mountainside, Luis halted the train. 
Half a day's journey from here, senor, he said, is the village of Takazama, which we have never visited. I think many ounces of gold may be procured there. It is worth the trial. Armstrong concurred, and they turned again upward toward Takuzama. The trail was abrupt and precipitous, mounting through a dense forest. As night fell dark and gloomy, Luis once more halted. Before them was a black chasm, bisecting the path as far as they could see. Luis dismounted, there should be a bridge, he called, and ran along the cleft the distance. It is here, he cried, and remounting, led the way. In a few moments Armstrong heard a sound, as though a thunderous drum were beating somewhere in the dark. It was the falling of the mule's hoofs upon the bridge made of strong hides lashed to poles and stretched across the chasm. Half a mile further was Takazama. The village was a congregation of rock and mud huts set in the profundity of an obscure wood. As they rode in, a sound inconsistent with that brooding solitude met their ears. From a long, low mud hut that they were nearing rose the glorious voice of a woman in song. The words were English, the air familiar to Armstrong's memory, but not to his musical knowledge. He slipped from his mule and stole to a narrow window in one end of the house. Peering cautiously inside, he saw, within three feet of him, a woman of marvelous imposing beauty, clothed in a splendid loose robe of leopard skins. The hut was packed close to the small space in which she stood with the squatting figures of Indians. The woman finished her song and seated herself close to the little window, as if grateful for the unpolluted air that entered it. When she had ceased, several of the audience rose and cast little softly falling bags at her feet. A harsh murmur, no doubt a barbarous kind of applause and comment, went through the grim assembly. Armstrong was used to seizing opportunities promptly. Taking advantage of the noise, he called to the woman in a low but distinct voice. Do not turn your head this way, but listen. I am an American. If you need assistance, tell me how I can render it. Answer as briefly as you can. The woman was worthy of his boldness. Only by a sudden flush of her pale cheek did she acknowledge understanding of his words. Then she spoke, scarcely moving her lips. I am held prisoner by these Indians. God knows I need help. In two hours come to the little hut, twenty yards toward the mountainside. There will be a light and a red curtain in the window. There is always a guard at the door, whom you will have to overcome. For the love of heaven, do not fail to come. The story seems to shrink from adventure and rescue and mystery. The theme is one too gentle for those brave and quickening tones. And yet, it reaches as far back as time itself. It has been named environment, which is as weak a word as any to express the unnameable kinship of man to nature, that queer fraternity that causes stones and trees and salt water and clouds to play upon our emotions. Why are we made serious and solemn and sublime by mountain heights, grave and contemplative by an abundance of overhanging trees, reduced to inconstancy and monkey capers by ripples on a sandy beach? Did the protoplasm? But enough. The chemists are looking into the matter, and before long they will have all life in the table of the symbols. Briefly then, in order to confine the story within scientific bounds, John Armstrong went to the hut, choked the Indian guard, and carried away Mademoiselle Girard. With her was also conveyed a number of pounds of gold dust she had collected during her six months' forced engagement in Takuzama. The Karabubu Indians are easily the most enthusiastic lovers of music between the equator and the French Opera House in New Orleans. They are also strong believers that the advice of Emerson was good when he said, The thing thou wantest, O discontented man, take it and pay the price. A number of them had attended the performance of the Alcazar Opera Company in Makuto and found Mademoiselle Gerard's style and technique satisfactory. They wanted her, so they took her one evening, suddenly and without any fuss. They treated her with much consideration, exacting only one song recital each day. She was quite pleased at being rescued by Mr. Armstrong. 
So much for mystery and adventure. Now, to resume the theory of the protoplasm. John Armstrong and Mademoiselle Gerard rode through the Andean peaks, enveloped in their greatness and sublimity. The mightiest cousins, furthest removed, in nature's great family, become conscious of the tie. Among those huge piles of primordial upheaval, amid those gigantic silences and elongated fields of distance, the littleness of men are precipitated as one chemical throws down a sediment from another. They moved reverently, as in a temple. Their souls were uplifted in unison with the stately heights. They traveled in a zone of majesty and peace. To Armstrong, the woman seemed almost a holy thing, yet bathed in the white, still dignity of her martyrdom that purified her earthly beauty and gave out, it seemed, an aura of transcendental loveliness. In those first hours of companionship, she drew from him an adoration that was half human love, half the worship of a descended goddess. Never yet since her rescue had she smiled. Over her dress she still wore the robe of leopard skins, for the mountain air was cold. She looked to be some splendid princess belonging to those wild and awesome altitudes. The spirit of the region chimed with hers. Her eyes were always turned upon the somber cliffs, the blue gorges, and the snow-clad turrets, looking a sublime melancholy equal to their own. At times on the journey, she sang trilling te deums and miseries that struck the true notes of the hills, and made their route seem like a solemn march down a cathedral aisle. The rescued one spoke but seldom, her mood partaking of the hush of nature that surrounded them. Armstrong looked upon her as an angel. He could not bring himself to the sacrilege of attempting to woo her as other women may be wooed. On the third day they had descended as far as the Tierra Templada, the zona of tablelands and foothills. The mountains were receding in their rear, but still towered, exhibiting yet impressively their formidable heads. Here they met signs of man. They saw the white houses of coffee plantations gleam across the clearings. They struck into a road where they met travelers and pack mules. Cattle were grazing on the slopes. They passed a little village where the round-eyed niños shrieked and called at sight of them. Mademoiselle Gerard laid aside her leopard-skin robe. It seemed to be a trifle incongruous now. In the mountains it had appeared fitting and natural. And if Armstrong was not mistaken, she laid aside with it something of the high dignity of her demeanor. As the country became more populous and significant of comfortable life, he saw, with a feeling of joy, that the exalted princess and priestess of the Andean peaks was changing to a woman, an earth woman, but no less enticing. A little color crept to the surface of her marble cheeks. She arranged the conventional dress that the removal of the robe now disclosed with the solicitous touch of one who is conscious of the eyes of others. She smoothed the careless sweep of her hair, a mundane interest, long latent, in the chilling atmosphere of the ascetic peaks showed in her eyes. This thaw in his divinity sent Armstrong's heart going faster. So might an Arctic explorer thrill at his first ken of green fields and liquescent waters. They were on a lower plane of earth and life and were succumbing to its peculiar, subtle influence. The austerity of the hills no longer thinned the air they breathed. About them was the breath of fruit and corn and builded homes, the comfortable smell of smoke and warm earth and the consolations man has placed between himself and the dust of his brother earth from which he sprung. While transversing those awful mountains, Mademoiselle Gerard had seemed to be wrapped in their spirit of reverent reserve. Was this that same woman, now palpitating, warm, eager, throbbing with conscious life and charm, feminine to her fingertips? Pondering over this, Armstrong felt certain misgivings intrude upon his thoughts. He wished he could stop there with this changing creature, descending no farther. Here was the elevation and environment to which her nature seemed to respond with its best. He feared to go down upon the man-dominated levels. Would her spirit not yield still further 
in that artificial zone to which they were descending. Now from a little plateau, they saw the sea flash at the edge of the green lowlands. Mademoiselle Gerard gave a little catching sigh. Oh, look, Mr. Armstrong, there is the sea. Isn't it lovely? I'm so tired of mountains. She heaved the pretty shoulder in a gesture of repugnance. Those horrid Indians. Just think of what I suffered. Although I suppose I attained my ambition of becoming a stellar attraction. I wouldn't care to repeat the engagement. It was very nice of you to bring me away. Tell me, Mr. Armstrong, honestly now, do I look such an awful, awful fright? I haven't looked into a mirror, you know, for months. Armstrong made answer according to his changed moods. Also, he laid his hand upon hers as it rested upon the horn of her saddle. Luis was at the head of the pack train and could not see. She allowed it to remain there, and her eyes smiled frankly into his. Then at sundown, they dropped upon the coast level, under the palms and lemons, among the vivid greens and scarlets and okras of the Tierra Caliente. They rode in the Makuto and saw the line of volatile bathers frolicking in the surf. The mountains were very far away. Mademoiselle Gerard's eyes were shining with joy that could not have existed under the chaperonage of the mountaintops. There were other spirits calling to her, nymphs of the orange groves, pixies from the chattering surf, imps born of the music, the perfumes, colors, and the insinuating presence of humanity. She laughed aloud, musically, at a sudden thought. Won't there be a sensation, she called to Armstrong. Don't I wish I had an engagement just now, though? What a picnic the press agent would have, held a prisoner by a band of savage Indians, subdued by the spell of her wonderful voice. Wouldn't that make great stuff? But I guess I quit the game, winner, anyhow. There ought to be a couple of thousand dollars in that sack of gold dust I collected as encores, don't you think? He left her at the door of the little hotel de Buen Descar, where she had stopped before. Two hours later he returned to the hotel. He glanced in at the open door of the little combined reception room and café. Half a dozen of Makuto's representative social and official caballeros were distributed about the room. Senor Villa Blanca, the wealthy rubber concessionist, reposed his fat figure on two chairs, with an emulent smile beaming upon his chocolate-colored face. Gilbert, the French mining engineer, leered through his polished nose glasses. Colonel Mendez, of the regular army, in gold-laced uniform and fatuitous grin, was busily extracting corks from champagne bottles. Other patterns of Macutan gallantry and fashion pranced and posed. The air was hazy with cigarette smoke. Wine dripped upon the floor. Perched upon a table in the center of the room, in an attitude of easy preeminence, was Mademoiselle Gerard. A chick costume of white lawn and cherry ribbons supplanted her traveling garb. There was a suggestion of lace, and a frill or two, with discreet small implication of hand-embroidered pink hosiery. Upon her lap rested a guitar. In her face was the light of resurrection, the piece of Elysium attained through fire and suffering. She was singing to a lively accompaniment a little song. When you see the big round moon coming up like a balloon, this nigger skipped fur to kiss the lips of a stylish black-faced coon. The singer caught sight of Armstrong. Hi there, Johnny, she called. I've been expecting you for an hour. What kept you? Gee, but these smoked guys are the slowest you ever saw. They ain't on at all. Come along in, and I'll make this coffee-colored old sport with the gold epaulets open one for you right off the ice. Thank you, said Armstrong. Not just now, I believe. I've several things to attend to. He walked out and down the street and met Rucker coming up from the consulate. Play you a game of billiards, said Armstrong. I want something to take the taste of sea level out of my mouth. End of A Matter of Mean Elevation